On Christmas Eve 1975, a 55-year-old pilot, businessman and professional violinist named Norman Peter Gibbs, more commonly known as Peter, departed from an airfield adjacent to the Glenforsa Hotel on the Isle of Mull, Scotland, never to be seen alive again. The circumstances surrounding his disappearance and mysterious death are nothing more than bizarre. Tonight on Dark Curiosities, The Great Mull Air Mystery. Peter Gibbs, who was a managing director of a property development company in London called Gibbs and Ray, arrived on the Isle of Mull, a small Hebridean island off the coast of Scotland, on the 20th of December 1975, along with his girlfriend, Felicity Granger, a former university lecturer. The purpose of the trip was mainly for Peter to search for investment opportunities, more specifically purchasing a hotel. Peter had taken part in various musical tours and led various orchestras over the years, including the BBC Northern Irish Orchestra and the BBC Scottish Orchestra, during which time he continued his passion for flying, joining the Surrey Flight Club in 1957. Peter eventually purchased his own de Havilland DH-82A Tiger Moth aircraft. During their trip to the Inner Hebrides, Peter, who was a veteran wartime pilot from January 1944 to March 1945, with Squadron 41 RAF clocking over 2,000 hours of flying experience, hired a Cessna aircraft from a local man and owner of the aircraft, Ian Hamilton. Gibbs flew the aircraft from its home of Oban over to the Glenforza Hotel on Mull. On the 24th of December 1975, Peter and Felicity flew the Cessna F-150H aircraft over to Broadford on the Isle of Skye to view a hotel and work on investing in it. Gibbs believed that an airlink would be valuable in making his proposed luxury hotel development profitable. After a long day, the couple returned to the Isle of Mull where Peter locked the plane in the hangar of the small airfield before returning to the Glenforza Hotel for a Christmas Eve dinner. Little did Peter know that this would be his last meal on the eve of Christmas and his birthday. After eating dinner and drinking a moderate amount of wine that night, Peter spontaneously decided that he wanted to go out for a brief night flight, despite the cold wintry weather and the fact that the airstrip had no runway lights, which would make landing extremely difficult. The stubborn Londoner left his girlfriend and staff at the hotel concerned about his proposed flight. However, Peter was convinced that it was possible to make a night landing at Glenforsa regardless of the adverse conditions. He didn't let anyone talk him out of flying that night. Many described Peter as a daredevil. Peter actually stated that he was merely informing the staff that he was going to fly that night and not asking for their permission. Gibbs also insisted that he did not need landing lights and ignored the local regulations which stated that flying at night was banned. Despite numerous reservations about flying that night, Felicity joined her boyfriend as they made their way to the airstrip at around 9.30pm on Christmas Eve night. The pair got into the Cessna aircraft and directed it from the hangar to the eastern end of the runway. After reaching the end of the runway, Felicity departed from the cockpit and placed two powerful torches about a foot apart facing the aircraft as instructed by Peter. Peter Gibbs to give him visual reference for when landing back on the aisle. Peter departed from Mull for a short flight, telling Felicity that he would land once, then return to prove how easy it was. However, he failed to return. By 10pm that night, Felicity became worried when her boyfriend hadn't returned to the island. The weather had deteriorated somewhat, a lot of rain and sleet falling. 
This was a huge cause for concern as these conditions are almost impossible to fly in due to low visibility. Felicity returned to the hotel and contacted the police two hours later after there was no sign of the aircraft or Peter Gibbs. Police soon arrived on the scene and inspected the airfield for any clues, however they found nothing out of the ordinary. The police also investigated the supposed flight path, however this also failed to bring up anything significant. Due to the adverse weather conditions, the search was called off for the night. On Christmas morning 1975, Peter Gibbs still had not returned, so the authorities launched a full-scale investigation. The Royal Air Force and Navy Air Service helicopters scoured the sea for wreckage, whilst hundreds of volunteers searched the island for any sign of Peter. Despite their best efforts, neither Gibbs or the aircraft could be located. Four months passed without any news, hope of finding Peter Gibbs alive somewhat dwindling. This was until a huge development came in April 1976, when a local shepherd named Donald McKinnon discovered something truly horrifying that baffled Scottish authorities. About a mile away from the Glenforza Hotel, Shepherd McKinnon discovered the fully clothed body of Peter Gibbs, about 400 feet from the base of a hill regularly scoured by shepherds in the area. Quite bizarrely, Peter's body was in full view of anyone that might have ventured onto the hill. Police had already searched the hill several times during their investigations, so how could Peter have gone unnoticed for four months? There was rarely a day when shepherds weren't on the hills at some point, which made this discovery even stranger. It seemed impossible for someone not to notice a dead man's body. Scottish authorities initially believed that Peter had to ditch the plane in the sea and swim to shore, where he then died from exposure. However, further investigations cast serious doubt on this theory. If the plane had been ditched, Peter would have had to swim ashore, climb a cliff face, cross the main road that led towards the Glenforza Hotel, and then walk a quarter of a mile uphill only to lie down on the hillside and suffer the effects of exposure. It seems highly unlikely that this is what happened to Peter Gibbs the night he died. Interestingly, there was absolutely no trace of seawater or marine microorganisms found on Peter's skin, clothes, watch or boots, leaving many of us to speculate whether Peter had been in the sea at all before he died. It is possible, however, that if Peter had been on the hill the entire time that the harsh weather conditions could have washed these organisms away. A very interesting point was that Peter was completely uninjured when he was found, other than a minor cut on one leg. This seems odd, especially if he had ditched the aircraft. Surely he would have exhibited more significant injuries. Also of note is that Peter's body seemed to be in very good condition when he was found, with no signs of decomposition or evidence of animal scavenging. Another theory is that Peter left the aircraft of his own accord, perhaps due to a technical issue, but no parachute was found near to where Peter's body was discovered. Some have even suggested that Peter was somehow murdered, and despite this being a quite far-fetched theory, it is entirely possible. It has been wildly theorised that Peter worked for MI5 in Northern Ireland, where his cover was blown, he was murdered, and then brought back to Mull, where whoever killed him placed his corpse on the hill as a warning. Some have speculated the possibility of a supernatural phenomena occurring, after it was rumoured that another set of lights were seen on the runway when Peter was taking off. However, Felicity denied these claims, stating that she was the only person present on the runway that night. One of the biggest questions remains unanswered. What happened to the aircraft? It seems most likely to be lying at the bottom of the sea. 
It wasn't until 11 years later in September 1986 when two local clam fishermen from Mull, brothers Richard and John Grieve, reported coming across a red and white Cessna aircraft on the seabed whilst diving in the sound of Mull, around a kilometre off the coast of Oban. The brothers did not find any human remains in the wreckage, but they did get the plane registration. G-A-V-T-N. The brothers claimed that the wreckage was in very bad condition and concluded that the plane had suffered a violent end. Both wings were unattached, one of the wheels had been ripped from the plane, the engine was found not far from the fuselage, but also both cockpit doors were locked. The only exit point of the wreckage was through a hole in the windscreen, which would have caused some kind of injury. When salvage teams were alerted of the discovery, they failed to locate it. The only evidence of this plane wreck was through a few photos taken by the Greaves brothers. However, they failed to capture the license plate. To this day, the aircraft in question has never been found. Intriguingly, in 2013, the Royal Navy did admit that an aircraft was found in the sea off the coast of Oban, supporting the fishermen's claims. However, the wreckage was largely intact, contrary to Richard and John Greaves' reports. Whether this wreckage found by the Royal Navy is the same aircraft supposedly discovered by the fishermen in 1986 remains up for much debate. What happened to Peter Gibbs on the night he vanished? How was his body in such good condition when he was found four months after he disappeared? Why did he go up to the hill instead of returning to the hotel for help? Had he been innocently missed on the hill for four months or had something far more sinister occurred? Had someone placed his corpse there? It is highly unlikely that we will ever know exactly what happened to Peter Gibbs on the night he died. Until a wreckage is found, this case leaves us with many perplexing questions that may never get any answers.